Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time has long been considered one of the greatest fantasy series of all time. It is as epic a story that has been told, spanning the length of 14 books, and these are not small books, mind you, but meaty ones. And the sheer scale of the series can be intimidating to many, scaring them off from starting the first book. I was originally in this camp, not wanting to get invested in such a long series that might not live up to my expectations. And when I heard about Amazon's adaptation of The Wheel of Time, I decided that I would watch the first season of the show, and if I liked it, I would read the books. And then I watched the first season, and on first viewing, it was pretty meh. At the end of the show, I was left thinking, this is the Wheel of Time? I thought surely there had to be more to it, and so even though I was by no means enamored by the show, I decided to start the books. Since watching the first season, I have read the first six books in the series, and I have to say that I enjoyed them and am definitely a fan of the series. There is in fact a lot more to the Wheel of Time than what we saw in the first season of the Amazon adaptation. And even though my opinion of the first season has actually diminished since I've started reading the books, I still think that it can be a great series of television. I think that season 1 was plagued by some very unique circumstances that affected the overall product. Over the course of this video, I will talk about some of my issues with the show, some of the positives, and why I think Amazon's The Wheel of Time still has the chance to be a good show, even if it doesn't reach the same quality of the books. Spoilers for season 1 of The Wheel of Time, as well as some spoilers for the first book in the series, The Eye of the World. That's the balance that I'm always lying awake at night thinking about is when are the right times to change things and when are the right times to keep things the same in order to tell the truest version of what's on the page. I feel like the fact that I watched the show before I read the books gives me an interesting perspective on how the show played to a new viewer, as well as how my interpretations changed after reading The Eye of the World. The book is told predominantly from Rand's POV, with about 80% of the book's word count coming from his perspective. In the book, it is very clear that Rand is the main character of the series, and all but guaranteed to be the Dragon Reborn. I think showrunner Rafe Judkin's decision to make the show more of an ensemble piece makes sense. The book is very much from Rand's perspective, and for the show we wanted to see it from all of our characters' perspectives. Especially as the books go on, and the stories of the other characters become more and more relevant. It is a decision that I think makes sense in an attempt to adapt the series. However, I think there are some issues that arise in its execution, and this will be a recurring theme to a lot of the changes the show made, where I can understand why they would make some of these changes, but the follow through and execution of them don't always land. In this instance, I think the mystery of who the dragon is doesn't really work that well in the show, and feels a little forced. We are explicitly told that 20 years ago, Moraine and Swan witnessed a fellow Aes Sedai have a vision that the dragon has just been reborn. You were there when she had the vision of the baby being born. We were the only ones We've there. been searching for the dragon reborn for 20 years. Yet, even though it's concrete that the dragon has to be 20 years of age, the show continues to try and suggest that people like Loghain and Nynaeve, who don't meet these criteria, could be the dragon. I feel that by trying to make it seem like anyone could be the dragon reborn makes each of these red herrings less believable, and the storyline feel more contrived. They even give Nynaeve a number of moments throughout the season, where she displays a massive amount of power, saving the day and further trying to convince the audience that she is the Dragon Reborn. And while Nynaeve has a ton of potential and is powerful in her own right in the books, the show seems to overemphasize how strong she is, to the point where by the end of the season, when Rand is revealed to be the dragon, most show-only watchers are left thinking that Nynaeve is stronger than him. This brings me to my next point, as even though I understand making the show more of an ensemble piece and less Rand-centric, it almost feels like they shifted the focus of the story so that that Moraine, Lan, and Nynaeve are the main characters. Most of the relevant screen time is given to these characters up until the final episode. Much of Rand's book storyline was condensed into a single episode. We had to find our way to tell that whole story in one or two episodes. We combined a lot of the Matt and Rand story into this one piece in Brain Springs. And while I understand that some compression of the story is necessary, it feels like they used the time they got from compressing Rand's story to focus on Moraine and Aes Sedai politicking. 
The primary focus of episodes 4, 5, and 6 are dealing with the death of an Aes Sedai, a warder's bond, and Moraine's daily routine. The Aes Sedai and Warder, Karenna and Stepan, have so much story dedicated to them despite being show-only characters and having little real impact on the story or any of the other characters' development. The whole point of these characters is to show how important the bond between an Aes Sedai and a warder is, but given how little time the show has, it feels like they could have conveyed this information without dedicating nearly two episodes to it. Cast it into the fire! Karenna and Stepan die, and the audience doesn't feel anything for them, and yet they have to attend both funerals. When I see moments like this in the show, it just reminds me of how we lost moments from the Rand and Matt storyline. Like, I understand condensing their travel log, but the show dedicated time to Karenna and Stepan instead of building up much more relevant and important characters. When Tom dies in episode 4, the audience feels nothing for him because he has only been in a few scenes. In the book, Tom is crucial in Rand and Matt's development, teaching them new skills and imparting on them wisdom from his travels. You really feel for him when he sacrifices himself to save them from the Fade. In the show, he's little more than a guy they met one time. By splitting focus with Stepan, the show gives the audience two deaths, three if you count Karenne, that the audience feels nothing about. Whereas if they didn't introduce these new characters and focused on telling Tom's story well, it would have been a lot more impactful. And even though I have complained here about how, in the show, Moraine has essentially been the main character up till this point, I understand why they would do that. Moraine's actress, Rosamund Pike, is the only member of the cast with any real name recognition before the start of this project. On top of that, she is a legitimately fantastic actress, so I understand why in the first season they would try and beef up her role as the fresh faces try and establish themselves, not unlike how Sean Bean was used in the first season of Game of Thrones. I understand this decision, but once again, I feel like the execution of it is somewhat flawed. And for the show, we really need her to have a juicy, big worthy of Rosamund Pike's story. I will give Rafe some credit, as one of the questions he asked Robert Jordan's widow, Harriet McDougall, and author Brandon Sanderson, who finished the series after Jordan's passing, if there was anything that Jordan regretted about the first book, or wished that he could have done differently. Rafe got two answers, the first being the ending, and the second being that Jordan wished he had Perrin and Matt more fully formed at the start of the series. I think this is a good way to approach adaptation, as even though Eye of the World is a fantastic book, nothing is perfect and things can always be improved upon in some areas, as long as the heart of the story stays the same. I think they have succeeded in making Perrin and Matt more compelling off the hop. In the case of Matt, they built on his mischievous nature by making him have very sticky fingers. He has a difficult home life, as his family is poor, with his dad seemingly drunk and abusive and his mom definitely abusive. Matt is left to look after his sisters, stealing so that he can help support them and giving him an immediate set of motivations for the things that he does. Matt is also much more of a sad boy in the show, and even though Matt is my favorite character in the books thus far, and the show version is definitely different in a lot of ways, when I watched the show first, I found show Matt and his situation immediately compelling. For the purposes of the show, I think they did a good job revamping his starting point. I don't think their attempt to make Perrin more interesting worked as well though, as I feel making him axe his wife in the first episode almost made him less compelling, as he seems to do almost nothing for the entire season besides sadly pouting to himself. As a viewer, you'd completely forget Perrin even had a wife if he didn't mumble about it being his fault every now and then. In interviews, Rafe has said that the intention behind Perrin fridging his wife was to start up Perrin's internal debate between the axe and the hammer, but I feel like it didn't translate very well onto the screen. Overall, I would say that around 85% of the show is either remixed or completely new material, with only about 15% of the show's events being true to the book. And as a book fan, I understand how this can be incredibly frustrating. The Wheel of Time was always going to be a series with a lot of changes when adapting it to the medium of television, just due to the massive size of it. Things were always going to be condensed and changed to better fit the medium, and so I think some degree of separation is required by book readers to enjoy the show. In order for the show to be successful, it needs to appeal to first-time watchers, even more than it does book readers. I think as long as the show stays true to the characters and the heart of the story, they should be able to make a great show. And at the end of the day, that's what matters, even if it's different from the books in some ways. Yeah, I think season one coming in, uh, we had a very clear plan of doing a longer season to tackle that and had to compress it 
The first season of The Wheel of Time was plagued by a set of unique problems that no doubt worsened the final product. The first issue that was outside of the show's control was its episode count. Even on my first watch of the show, when I had yet to read any of the books, the show felt rushed a lot of the time. There were moments, like in episode 5, where Nynaeve appears out of nowhere to find Rand and Matt in Tar Valen. There was no setup to this, and it feels incredibly jarring to watch. Given how the show is tasked with introducing a complex new fantasy world alongside a large cast of characters, I couldn't help but think that the story would have been better told if it had been given more episodes. I can't help but feel like an 8 episode count is far too few for a show like The Wheel of Time. And it turns out showrunner Rafe Judkins was of the same mindset, as his initial plan for the season was to have 10 episodes. Somewhere along production, the Amazon suits shortened the season length to 8 episodes, stressing that the shorter length would make it more bingeable. Because the show had anticipated 10 episodes and had initially based their story plans on this, when they learned that the episode count was reduced, they had to scramble to some degree. Even though season 2 is again slated to be 8 episodes, and while I still think 10 episodes would be far better, the fact that Rafe and the production team had considerable more foreknowledge of the episode count allowed for them to plan accordingly. Hopefully, this should help season 2 feel less rushed, as they were given more time to adapt to the episode count. Another major hurdle thrown at the Wheel of Time was the departure of one of its main cast members in Barney Harris, who played Matt Cawthon. For a lot of people, having an actor change, especially for one of the show's leads, can be a deal breaker, harming the audience's immersion as they have to suspend their disbelief that these two are the same person. To make matters worse, Harris left in the middle of production, leaving the writer's room to have to rewrite parts of the final two episodes. When the party goes into the ways, Matt was supposed to go with them, and because he didn't, the show had to try and justify it. That's why in the lead up, Moraine was insistent that all five of them needed to go to the Eye of the World, as any of them could be the Dragon Reborn, only for her to say at the start of the very next episode that it's good that Matt didn't come, because even if he is the dragon, he would choose the side of the Dark One. The show was in a tough spot, and as a result, it doesn't make all that much sense. It's also pretty clear that in episode 8, when Perrin confronts Padden Fane, it was likely originally meant to be Matt. Matt is the only character to have a meaningful interaction with Fane before this, so naturally, it would have much more impact if Matt confronted him rather than Perrin. What no one could have predicted, and what ended up having a massive impact on the production of the show, was the COVID-19 pandemic. The Wheel of Time was one of the shows that was filming before the pandemic started, and had to halt production for a number of months. This not only made the production disjointed, but impacted the show in a number of ways. It's no surprise that the final episode of the show has some of the biggest flaws on display. When the show renewed production, there were new restrictions in place that likely limited some of what they had initially intended. For example, in the Battle at Tarwin's Gap, Nynaeve and Egwene walk on screen from nowhere so that they can stand in a big empty field with three other women. This looks goofy and pretty low budget, and I doubt it's what the show had initially planned. With restrictions on large groups of people and crowd scenes, the show could only work within the limits presented to them. With no crowds, the show had to rely on CG work to bring the invading Trolloc army to life, as opposed to the more practical effects they used earlier in the season. The CG Trolloc army honestly looked pretty rough. In a Reddit AMA, Rafe even mentioned how COVID affected the visual effects team, which impacted the show's quality. This can also be seen in Nynaeve's fake out death, which was one of the worst moments of the first season. Supposedly, Nynaeve was not meant to look dead in this scene just wounded. It was supposed to be a callback to Nynaeve teaching Egwene about being a wisdom and have her heal her. This didn't translate well though, because as a viewer, it looks like Nynaeve dies and Egwene magically brings her back from the dead. From what I've read, some wires got crossed in the editing room and they didn't have all the shots that they needed to bring the scene to life in the way that they intended. I feel at this point I might as well take their word for it, as the scene is pretty awful, so hopefully we can just move on from it and chalk it up to COVID complicating things. Overall, I think the first season of The Wheel of Time had a bit of a rough go of it, marred by a series of unique and unforeseeable circumstances. It's not likely that another main cast member will leave in the middle of production, or that a global pandemic will disrupt the show, and as a result, the seasons moving forward should be better. I think giving the show some benefit of the doubt is reasonable in this scenario. They forget the dragon is just as likely to save the world as break it.
Even though the Wheel of Time had to endure some issues outside of their control, they didn't always make the perfect writing decisions. I describe Wheel of Time Season 1 as a mixed bag, because I thought there were some good elements as well as some bad elements. On the good side, one of the things I noted was how you can find Pad and Fane in the background of many of the locations as he hunts Rand and company. It's one of those things that some people won't notice, but those eagle-eyed viewers that do, it makes the show feel more rewarding, as there is a very clear attention to detail in parts of the show. Also, one of the show's strengths is that they do their best to capture as many real locations as possible. Whether this means building a small village or flying to beautiful locations, there's a commitment from the production staff to try and bring some of the best on-screen environments that they can. Things that's really important to us with the show is trying to put as much on camera as we can and do it in camera. There are also some pretty good interactions between characters, with Rand and Matt's promise being a highlight, as well as when Matt and Tom have a small moment. The cold opens to the episodes are hit or miss for me, with Loghain at Gildon and the lead up to Rand's birth being the two best ones. On the opposite end of the spectrum are Karenna's funeral, which looks fine but feels like a waste of time, and Nynaeve's escape, which also feels kind of dumb to me. Moving on to some of the more negative aspects of the show that I haven't mentioned yet are these random small moments that feel cheap and indulgent. In episode 7, when Nynaeve randomly blurts out that Rand and Perrin should stop treating Egwene like a prize to be won. Stop! I am so tired of you two fighting over her like she's something you can win! I was like, huh? This feels like it comes way out of left field, and not something that I had pictured at all. It feels like forced artificial melodrama. The show uses fake out deaths a number of times in an attempt to create some artificial suspense. They do it in episode 1 with Nynaeve, episode 4 with Lan, and episode 8 with Moraine, Nynaeve, and Loyal. These almost always feel unnecessary, and do little other than cheapen the stakes. Rafe even had to clarify in an interview, after the fact, that Loyal wasn't dead, which to me is a pretty big indication of some poor storytelling. I think if Rafe and the writers can resist some of their worst tendencies, the good elements of the show will be allowed to shine in season 2. Today isn't the end, it's the beginning. I think it's fair to say that The Wheel of Time's first season had a fair share of issues. Some of them were self-inflicted, while others came as a result of random, unpredictable circumstances. I think a lot of the show's largest issues came as a result of things outside of their control. They were forced to adapt to the best of their ability, but even so, a number of flaws resulted from this. These unique set of circumstances are not likely to occur again, and so moving forward, the show will not be subjected to these same issues. I think I've seen enough good aspects in the show as well as knowing where the story goes in the books, to expect that the show will improve going forward. Even though the first season had some unforced errors, I have faith that they have learned from their mistakes and will not make similar ones in the future. The fact that I am able to understand the decisions they made in adaptational changes gives me faith that they have a good understanding of the books and will try and do their best to bring the story to television. I still expect that season 2 will have its flaws, and that I won't like every change that they decide to make from the book. But I feel like the show is better than its first season has led us to believe, and that going forward I am hopeful that it can be a good television show. If you somehow made it to the end of the video, I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. It really helps out the channel. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.